This is Critical Nonsense, our high lowbrow show about culture, science, and tech. This week, Joey asks me about AI centaurs. Centaurs? Centaurs. You know what I mean. Woo! I was going to sing the never ending story song, but I don't feel like I know it enough. So this is what a Joey sounds like. <laughs> and this is what an executive producer and Falcor Jess Vander sounds like. What did you just call me? Hi, this is Jess. <laughs> you know, the dragon dog from the never ending story. I the still flowing don't even know what that is. pink hair. The never ending story. A film Gosh. series. A novel. You make me feel older than anyone in my life. (laughs) You're welcome. I'm sorry. It's one of those. I think it it is the convergence of the fact that we do have a number of years between us, but you also have like not a large wealth of pop culture reference knowledge. Excuse you. You take that back. I know many things. We just don't have overlapping trivia segments. Like if you were, you and I were to do trivia together, we would offer different things. Also, sidebar, I'm terrible at trivia. (laughs) I love trivia. I was like, (laughs) I I, I bring everything to the table at trivia. I Uh, love trivia. Yeah, I feel like you and Aaron, I would want on my trivia team. And then I would sort of coast. It's like the one area, like I'm not a coasting type. But I would absolutely coast on the trivia team to just revel in other people having the answers and me being like, cool, I'll write it down. I'll be the scribe. And then you'll be like, the Brannock device. <laughs> uh, <laughs> every, the, every 10 questions, I'll have one. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Jessica, do we have any, um, have you, do you have any updates or corrections related to your theories of success or (laughs) packing or anything that we need to address before getting into this week's conversation? So packing wise, I've in the last 24 hours had to pack yet again for a travel. And in this experience, um, uh, a conversation has somehow simultaneously happened in the company um, advice column chat uh, wherein people were talking about travel backpacks and that a far underutilized but verging on essential backpack trait for traveling is, which I'm realizing as I'm saying, this is not really packing. This is just travel related and having the things required for travel. But Having a backpack with a strap that runs across the back so that you can slide it over your roller bag handle so that it will sit atop it without sliding around. And instead, if you're like me, you sort of like attempt to recreate this phenomenon by like crisscrossing the backpack straps yeah. over it. and it, Crisscross and applesauce. It, but it does not work. <laughs> it just slides. It around. does. <laughs> crisscross applesauce works every time. <laughs> crisscross applesauce. Um, so that is one thing that is a very long drawn out comment. Another long drawn out comment about packing um, is uh, never knowing what to do about toiletries because there is this thing where there are some things that you can pack that at any amount of time in advance, but there are some things that you are actively using. And so you must wait to pack it until the day of, unless you are someone who is living in luxury and just has second copies of all of those things, like another toothbrush. (laughs) What an (laughs) indulgence. (laughs) But but if you're like me, you just have to wait till or, or things, you know, you can't like medication and other stuff like that. But the, the morning of, oh no, I didn't leave enough room for my toiletry bag is a, mm. a different type of panic that I think a lot of people might be able to relate to. And then it's just like, I guess that's in my carry on now. I guess I just <laughs> have the floss at the ready at any time, which is not the worst. It's not the worst thing. 
I mean, uh, this has been another episode of Jess's travel anxiety. Um, <laughs> with, <laughs> which is like also potentially an episode of Jess being appalled at how Joey does. It. Like I just have in my backpack, like <laughs> there's floss there always like all the time never gets used it's just there like it is just a a a void of nonsense and like an absolute bundle but i know it's there so um all right jessica i want to talk to you about centaurs don't play me like this because that sounds fun but i actually know it's not about (laughs) centaurs (laughs) <laughs> it is about centaurs. So, um, you know, we've been, this is not the first time we've spoken about generative AI and, and sort of the implications of AI. But since the last time we spoke about this, which I, I think we discussed sort of generative AI art in Mid Journey and Dolly 2 and some of the uh, evolutions of that last year and discussions about you know, is it going to eliminate artists and, and all of those questions? Um, we have been in the recent, let's call it the past three months, a sort of fever pitch, maybe for the past four months of conversations about generative AI as it relates to the launch of chat GPT and sort of evolutions in those platforms and additional platforms that have come out. And while we're not going to sort of go into the deep dive on the benefits and merits of those different things or, you know, uh, you know, the, the size of the models or, I mean, maybe just if you, if you want to talk about, uh, the training and, uh, you know, transformer conversation, maybe we can try to go there. But what I'm more interested in is there's been a couple of studies that have you know, early academic studies that have come out now that chat TV, chat GPT has been readily available and been able to be used in things where academics like management academics and, and things like that. Um, Ethan Mollick has been talking a lot about this. He's a professor at uh, Wharton and sharing sort of emerging things that have been coming out um, about the impact that uh, the sort of introduction of generative AI into an individual employee's sort of workflow or, you know, giving them access to it in certain tasks is having on their performance and things like that. And it made me think a lot about an idea that I think we've mentioned on here before, but uh, this idea of centaurs that I think I'm not sure whether it was coined by Gary Kasparov, but I think maybe popularized in certain circles by Gary Kasparov after Deep Blue beat him at chess. He started Centaur Chess, which is any number of people or any number of AIs can be on either team and you compete in a single game. What's interesting is that, you know, the Centaurs always beat human-only opponents, but the Centaurs also always beat AI only opponents as well. Um, And this idea sort of that emerged out of that is this like benefit of multi style, different intelligences bringing things to the table. And in sort of the panic and frenzy around what is generative AI going to do to us? And are we all going to lose our jobs? And is the world world going to end? Which maybe all of those things are non zero chances that any of those things could be happening um i think there's a sort of opportunity to look at what is to come a little bit differently and so jess my question for you is how do you feel about centaurs and what centaur do you want to be what are my options I don't know. We're we're in a unknown future state, right? We don't know exactly how these things are going to roll out, but in some of these studies that are coming out, one from um, some folks at MIT, um, Shaked Noy and Whitney Zhang 
at MIT wrote a paper called Experimental Evidence on the Productivity Effects of Generative Artificial Intelligence. And what they found was that individual actors had a uh, uh, 0.8 standard deviation decrease in time to achieve a specific output and a 0.4 standard deviation increase in the quality that arises when an individual actor is working with generative intelligence and so the idea is that you can get to, you can get things done almost a full standard deviation faster and half a standard deviation almost better with the current tools available and so my thinking is right you know as we're talking about where does all of this end up and what will our jobs look like in these instances there's another study that had um come out that spoke about um, people actually being significantly happier um, when they're performing their jobs in these instances. That paper um, is called When and How Artificial Intelligence Augments Employee Creativity by Nan Jia, uh, Xuming Luo, Zheng Feng, and Cheng Cheng Liao. Uh, out of USC, Temple, Sichuan University, and yeah, and Sichuan University, but it spoke about how like people were sort of enjoying their work more because it was like faster, more effective, they're more productive. And so all this, you know, and all of the fears about this, like, I don't think people are like, oh, maybe I'll like my job better hasn't been <laughs> one of the topics of conversation or I may enjoy my work experience better because I can produce more and and uh, feel more satisfied in in what it is that I produce. Um, and I don't. I'm, I'm curious. Like, how does that sit with you? Like the idea that things may actually be like positive from this. As someone who I know has a certain amount of like reticence and skepticism around this conversation. Interesting. I feel like. It, what you're saying, which is fair, is like, what if we just think about AI like another person to collaborate with? You know, like that's basically the point, right? Like if you think of them as a collaborator versus a substitute, then also things can be good. But I think with any amount of teamwork, someone is doing something like they are playing a role in that team. And I think the, mm -hmm. of course, skepticism comes from, uh oh, is that the role I tend to play? Like, <laughs> is it, is it yeah. like, are they going to be the me of the team? Because then where do I go if I don't do that? Um, it, which makes a lot of sense. Um, and I, I bet in certain contexts, the type of collaborator that they are is more useful in a, you know, with a, a different mix of people. Like, you know, how we know how teams that are more diverse working teams like produce more creative outcomes and things like that. Like, mm -hmm. of, of course, it makes sense by adding yet another point of view that would on net be beneficial to, to that type of end. But um, it's also working with some, it's like working with somebody <laughs> different and like knowing how to ask them questions and like knowing how to interact with them. That's kind of interesting. I guess... I'm trying to understand what a centaur has to do with any of this because I still feel pretty good that this is not a conversation about centaurs and instead well, it's a conversation about teamwork. I think the original idea came from, right, like a centaur is half horse, half person and sort of like takes the best of both of those sides as a mythological beast. It has like the full body of a horse and instead of like the neck and head protruding, it is like from hips up of a human being. So it has the intelligence of a person and the hands and manual dexterity arms of a person. But then it has the body and legs of a horse that is like powerful and fast and can run far and do all of these things. And, and you know, in battle, which is I think a lot of the context where centaurs maybe came up, although, you know, I'm not a Greek mythology expert by any means. I remember some, um, it, it, you know, they were incredible. Uh, they're basically like a, 
a cavalry and a uh, like militia in one. And so they were more effective fighters on the field of battle in mythological stories. Right. And so in this instance, right, you know, when it came to chess, it was like half person, half AI competing against other half people, half AI uh, intelligences at chess. Um, and now we're sort of saying like, because the, the models and, you know, particularly large language models, at least in, in how we're thinking about things today are, you know, suddenly like radically advanced and capable of doing really interesting things. Instead of saying like, it's going to take my job. What does it mean when you say like, oh, I could just be significantly improved at my job. There's this idea, I, I think it's called um, the lump labor fallacy. Uh, yeah, the lump labor fallacy is the assumption that there is a fixed amount of work to be done. If this were true, new jobs could not be generated, just redistributed. This, this comes up a little bit in this AI discussion where it's like, you know, uh, the amount of output of any given company is at X and you introduce AI models that are able to do, you know, like percent X uh, that an employee could do. So the employer would then theoretically just only use AI agents, whereas, uh, and be, you know, cheaper, it would be like more efficient in producing that. But the way that a lot of people talk about this is like, if you have a current cost, you have all of these employees and you introduce a bunch of AI into the mix, what if you can do 5x instead, right? Like your company can grow, it can be more productive, it can increase, you know, the speed with which it produces whatever it's producing. And so why would you just, you know, say, I'm going to keep my production at a static level and just reduce costs as opposed to increase your ability or effectiveness in doing whatever it is you're doing and do more of that or better of that yeah. Uh, yeah. with an expanded workforce. Yeah, I feel like that is just sort of the, like, it's like the market theory conversation around AI and, like, people coming to terms with that. What I think is more interesting about this, like, this thing that you're introducing here, though, is, like, what other than the market trade-offs of introducing AI, like how else can we think about it? And I'm realizing that like, I think I am more drawn and maybe even more open to the framing of AI being an additional team member than perhaps like the Centaurian or Chimerian or Minotaurian interpretation of AI as like <laughs> a kind of hybrid self or like a biohacked self like that that sort of individualistic augmentation is not appealing to me. And it's in fact also scary in, uh, it's in a different way than sort of those market fears are for me. I think it's that idea of, um, you know, thinking about yourself and the value that you have to offer and that that would somehow be changed, you know, changing like what you can provide as an individual Whereas if you are imagining AI as, you know, somebody to add to your team, like a, like a superhero or like somebody mm -hmm. who's like who you'd want on your team, then it feels, it doesn't, it doesn't feel for some reason, like you need to be lessened for, to make space for mm -hmm. this addition. And I think that's kind of like this introduction that you're saying of like the lump labor fallacy in the market context is a great example of like this pattern of, um, you know, when I'm thinking about AI, it feels like I have to let go of something or I have to compromise on something or maybe not compromise, but like that I have to, that something has to change about me, which is different than like, you know, it, it, it might need to change the way I think about interacting with this thing and how it can help me and where it won't help me. And, um, that sort of, um, that collaborative interpretation <laughs> of what this yeah. could do is a lot more appealing and also like weird to, to, yeah. it's like a net new thing to, to figure out. Yeah. I think, you know, the, I don't disagree with 
anything that you said. I think it, it's just sort of like a perspective in framing. And I think what what that idea of like the term centaurs or whatever is, is viewing any team as like a holistic entity. And then the question of which, you know, which portion of this you know, chimera or, or centaur or whatever are you providing? I think what's interesting about this is like, you know, in this instance, the AI is like the horse legs, right? It is like doing a lot of the labor. That's what I was going to ask. So like, if you look into the, the, like, I think typically Greek mythological creatures, um, or mythical creatures, um, they are all very like variant combinations of like a subs like a smaller set of like peak animals. So like the Sphinx, the Hippogriff, the Centaur, the Chimera, the Pegasus, the Griffin, like all of those are some combination of human, lion, eagle, horse, and snake, I think. As though those are or like bull. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The minotaur is like, yeah, bull. Right. Bull. Okay. Yeah. So, but but, like probably like the top 10 strengths and it took me to a place of like, (laughs) if there were, you know, the equivalent like personality test or like Enneagram or Myers-Briggs of like your, I guess like Chinese Zodiac is like the closest approximation, right? It's like the Chinese Zodiac of like what you provide in work and like productivity contexts. Um, what animal would the AI be? And it's interesting that you said horse as in, in like, is that the type of like, are horse people, the people who should be afraid? <laughs> like what, is, is yeah. horse? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, I mean, right? maybe, right. I, I think like in the centaur example, I think it is a horse. It's like literal horsepower, right. From like a computational perspective, like we would use, we use that metaphor, you know, from like physical labor or like kinetic movement perspective, like the power of one horse for a car, right? Like how much can it pull and how fast can it go and so on? Uh, What I think in this case, the way that I've been sort of framing it to date is that the sort of, at least in our current iteration of tools that are sort of emerging right now based on large language models, it has no executive function. It is not going to act independently from whatever you do. And so it's dependent on you to sort of take on the executive defu- the executive function to deploy it on whatever challenge and in whatever way you need to accomplish something, right? Like it is adding horsepower to what, you, you know, I'll give you like a few examples of what I've used it for like recently effectively and just been like oh this is like amazing right like i was trying to build a really complicated uh uh equation in sheets in sort of data processing and i might have turned to like you and trevor and chloe in the past to be like help me build this equation why is this equation not working or or christopher uh and, and you know, in the instances up until now, I like even with Christopher, I had not been able to get this equation to work. He couldn't, and he is like very expert at Excel. And through like 30 minutes of just like iterating and working through it, I was able to get this equation to work. And I was like, holy shit, like I have been trying to do this one I equation did it for months. With its help. And <laughs> yeah. And suddenly it could do it. But then there are other instances, right, where that is like a very like logic based like knowledge base, like maybe I could have figured out, but I would have had to like learn all of the sort of coding language of Excel, which I am not an expert at in order to create it, even though I knew what I needed to do with the data and like mathematically I understood what I needed it to do. I just couldn't make it happen. Uh, And then like other instances are like, I've been going through like review season and I've used it as a supplement in that process to either gut check anything that I'm missing, like uh, ensure that I'm sort of communicating strengths and growth areas like effectively, like is it clear? And in some instances it's given like 
really pointed, clear feedback uh, uh, around certain things where I'm like, or identified things that I was, I was sort of missing because I wasn't tuned into them. Maybe I, I had like, it's not, you know, not like a, a bias in sort of like demographic or people style. I may just like prefer certain types of skills to other types of skills. And it was like, mm-hmm. actually, this thing is like coming through consistently in their reviews and you were just sort of tuning it out and like, oh, that's a good thing to bring up. And so like in these instances or like I got it to do a factor analysis and like clustering. And I was like, I know instances when it's able when it's relevant to do a factor analysis, but I can't do a factor analysis myself. And so in all of these instances, it's like I have to tell it, I have to like, you know, create an input and a prompt in a way that is like telling it what to do. But in all of those instances or most of those instances, it was a thing I wasn't capable of doing myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's in some ways, like, it's funny because we're so used to turning to our computers for things already, like, just asking, (laughs) asking it a question. And now it's like, you can ask like a shockingly complicated question, and it still can just do that for you, which is funny, because it's, it's actually a more familiar task in that way. I also, um, as you're thinking about this, I think um, another, another thing that it reminded me of is um, the types of, um, biological interactions that like say fish can have with one another. And like the immediate instinct might be to be like, oh, AI is a parasite. Like it's taking, like it's taking (laughs) for me because like we are teaching it and like it is, it requires us to give it things. Um, where in like, I don't know, I, I wonder if maybe what you're suggesting here, this is not, again, necessarily a revelation, but like, is it more of like a commensalist or like mutualist kind of relationship where either like it actually gives you stuff and doesn't really need much in return. Cause like it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't like benefit in that same kind of a way or, or maybe you do have to teach it and give and, you know, feed it and water it and whatever. Um, but what you get is help cracking this research problem that even other team members couldn't figure out because th- that's not how their brains work, but a computer brain kind of works that way. Um, yeah. And I, like, I, I think again, I'm just drawn to this space of like the frame of how we consider this tool and what will make it less intimidating or um, potentially like what will inspire us to see that it can be useful in ways we didn't even realize that we could use it for. Yeah, I mean, it makes me think about like mitochondria and and sort of like eukaryotes and things like that, where this sort of like symbiosis that was able to, you know, through like the simple enveloping of mitochondria into larger cells, like all of a sudden a massive amount of complexity was able to emerge yeah. through the yeah. introduction of a single thing. Like obviously... AI models, depending on how you view it, are like massively more complex or maybe not. I mean, mitochondria are like quite complex if you think about it from like a pure like machinery perspective and their ability to like produce, you know, DNA and RNA and and Mm -hmm. process energy. But like the, the universe and like the story of life seems to be just a continued trajectory towards like increasing complexity from Mm -hmm. the sort of entropy of the universe and this seems like a new massive wave in increased complexity and sort of like ultimately like the conversations that we're talking about of like how do we use it and what does it mean is us just contending with like a very punctuated introduction of a significant amount of complexity into our day-to-day lives yeah and like with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah, and also, absolutely. Uh, and also, like, validity to all of that conversation that, I, you know, we're not getting into. But, you know, I yeah. also, also fair and valid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Also, absolutely the alignment problem. And we need to make sure that there are yeah. friends. Um, yeah. All right, Jess, do you want to try and do a wrap-up corner? Uh, Jess's centaur corner? 
yeah, look, I'll give it to you. There are some things that this conversation had to do with centaurs, not just sort of the chess story of um, superpowering, problem solving with the power of multiples, but also the idea of the kind of force that AI brings into our world. Maybe it's kind of like a horsepower, or maybe it's kind of like a team member, but there are ways that we can think about the good that AI can bring, even though there are plenty of things that are reasonable to be scared about of what it couldn't in terms of market conditions, in terms of societal implications. Like All of that makes a lot of sense, but in terms of your day-to-day, maybe even your job, we're already seemingly, per what you found, Joey, starting to see that there are immediate benefits that can sort of make everybody um, able to do more things if we just unite horse with head or whatever animal you want to call it. And some biology talk, because why not? Um, Yep, I think that was about it. I I mean, I think you covered it. The only thing we didn't address is what type of centaur you want to be. Um, or, or I, I don't know creature. if you gave me a, I don't know if you gave me a sufficient answer, but if I had to fuse animal strengths, I don't know. I think the line is, um, the, the line Eagle combo is pretty, pretty difficult to beat. Uh, with your is, head on it, <laughs> a lion. Yeah. Eagle which is Griffin. With the Jess head. Yeah. Yeah, right. Right. Lion, lion, eagle, human. That's just pretty OP, so, you know. <laughs> so it, yeah. So it's basically just like ChatGPT and Midjourney and Jess fused into yeah, one. Yeah, that's the, that's the being. super the super team member. <laughs> Absolutely, I am involved in that somehow. <laughs> yeah, got it. Well, we did our work here. That's right. <laughs> Critical nonsense is a Sylvain production. Brought to you by Horseshoes for Humans. If you are a human who needs some horseshoes, boy, do we got the shoes for you. (laughs) Uh, As always, we'd like to thank our executive producer and smithy, Jess Vander. Thanks, Joey. We'd also like to thank sound engineer and our literal horsepower, figurative horsepower, Alex (laughs) Cottel. We'd like to thank (laughs) our programming coordinator and medusa les jacobs oh that's good and thank you to our production crew and the soaring eagles of our land sorry gilbert no rough master <laughs> as always thanks Helen. thanks special thanks to Forks. fun analogies like oh. centaurs thanks gary kasparov <laughs> you know what you know what though is a hybrid that we don't need is the spork It's just worse at both. So just be done with it. I don't know how I feel. Like, what about like the, the spork knife? There's some of those in camping gear that is like a spork with a knife edge on it also, which I'm like, like part of me is like, it's kind of cool. And then the other part of me is like, yeah, but (laughs) when do I need a spork knife? I am of the belief that a fine-edged spoon and chopsticks are the only utensils you need to eat anything. But, you know, that's another time for another contentious topic. (laughs) Thanks, flatware. uh, Or cutlery. (laughs) Thanks both. This is about gratitude. We're thankful to... We're just, like, super thankful for all of these options that there are. Really thankful for the ceramic spoon, which has a different value than the metal spoon. Uh, Would also like to thank Mythology. Thanks for helping us dream. And for socks, for keeping our toes warm. And, and, you know, just, you know, to keep good with Pascal's wager, thanks to our new AI overlords that will love this show and think that we're very good and want to be our yeah. friends totally because, we know. said it first we totally kowtowed as soon as we could because <laughs> yes sorry Thanks, for Pascal. all of our mistakes <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um well you know thanks joy for bringing this topic 
Till next time. Bon voyage. Sayonara. Adios. Other goodbyes. I don't know anymore. <laughs> Au revoir. Love you. Mean it. Bye. Bye. deleting emails from my inbox.